and it's really a privilege and an honor every time, but especially this time, to welcome Ross Chapin. Ross has become a friend, a colleague, uh, a distant mentor, as I observe. I think a lot of people in this community become mentors and they don't know it yet. <laughs> right? Anybody else know that? Like you've been watching them and observing them and learning from them and maybe not even told them yet, so I should tell you that. <laughs> I've, been, I've been watching you lately work with youth uh, as a mentor and that has moved me tremendously. Um, I also get to congratulate you for having heard that just this week you were honored as a fellow among the AIA and the Association of Ar American Architects. I may be getting the acronym wrong, but it's a big honor in Washington, D.C. later this year. He'll be acknowledged for his contributions to the art of the country. Um, I also have the honor of being able to live amidst some of his creations. So last year, I moved into um, the Highlands, of which I'm surrounded by a pocket neighborhood that he designed, which the Pocket Neighborhood book I'm sure you're all aware of and he referenced tonight. But really tonight, and finally, the topic is wholeness. And I can't imagine a better community to talk about what is wholeness, what is the container of wholeness, how do we create a sense of wholeness within our homes, within design, within our community structure of people. And I'm going to hand that over and welcome Ross and let's begin the conversation. Thank you so much, and uh, I, um, I'm going to attempt tonight, can you hear me fine? No? Yes? Just, okay. Uh, I'm going to attempt to uh, uh, translate some of what I know into words. Um, <laughs> sometimes I think that uh, English is my second language. So. Um, you know, what I'd like to do is to uh, bring us into a field together and um, through, through a, a little helpful tool here. So I'm going to play a little music and then we'll begin, see where it goes. Um, Canadian goose. <laughs> You're uh, in a marsh, northern Ontario. You've had a wonderful summer. The minnows have been good. A little seaweed and the insects, and uh, you've had a fill. It's just been really wonderful being with your friends and your cousins and your all your family all around. And um, but you know. The, the nights are getting a little longer, the days are getting shorter, and oh, but it's been such a wonderful year. You start feeling just a little bit fidgety, just agitated somehow. You don't quite know why, but something's up. And you look around and you see that, that your cousins you know, over there are also feeling just a little bit out of sorts and kind of going around, but what's up? Let's just get back to eating minnows and so forth. And uh, 
but yeah, this, uh, this agitation, uh, this restlessness begins to grow stronger and stronger and stronger until all of a sudden it's like it's beyond you. All you can do is lift your wings and fly. Just get out of here. And once you're up in the air, you look around and, and well, there's your brother and your sister and your cousins and your aunts and uncles and, and they're all flying too. And my gosh, it's the neighborhood. We're all flying. It's the city. The entire city has gotten up and we're flying together in the same direct direction. How do we know? So, this, this whole idea of of this uh, restlessness before the migration, the Great Migration. Uh, the German biologists have a word for it. It's called Zugenruha. Mm -hmm. And I first heard the word from Jason McLennan, who is uh, an architect. He's the leader of the uh, Cascadia Green Building, Green Building Alliance. Alliance. Alliance, yes. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> and he's also written a book uh, called Zugen Ruha, which I have so, I've been so touched by. And I'm bringing it forward here because they, the, um, uh, the whole idea, I think, is really apropos. He says that we as a culture, as a society, are in our own moment of Zugen Ruha, our own moment of restlessness. That sums up. Can you feel it? Mm -hmm. Kind of feeling itchy, agitated. We gotta, we gotta do some changes. We gotta shift. But where do we go? Which direction? So, I bring this up, and I'm gonna start out by thinking about wholeness. I wanna just touch in, and I'm gonna be doing, I think this evening, some, some weaving of different ideas back and forth, and so I'll pick them up here and there. But how does this fit into wholeness? So, wholeness is the idea of, of uh, being uh, complete and whole and part of an extended continuum of wholeness. And so my actions on behalf of my urges and desires and passions and my family and my community, as I act those, I when I'm in tune, I'm also acting on behalf of the whole. And so I'm not part of something that's different. We are not different. We are together in a wholeness, in a, in a continuum together. Each of us unique um, geese. <laughs> so the problem is that, uh, so I am, we are, you are born whole into a society that divides and dissects and dismembers and uh, sees things in terms of separation, in terms of commodities. And so we're trained in schools, we're trained just by our language, by the way we think, to, um, to, to, to separate and to individuate. Well, individuate is good. But somehow or another, we've gotten to a point where we have uh, uh, put ourselves in a place where we have um, spoiled our nest, and on a very, very large scale, we are perhaps at some risk uh, as a species, as a planet. And I think there's some acknowledgement around that. There's certainly more and more, but I think believe that we're coming there. And the challenge is, how do we... Uh, make the shift. The individual challenge, perhaps, is what are, what's the direction? Where is south? How do we know where to go? And actually, I think we do know where to go. And I think that uh, if we, if we, um, if we but follow what interests us, uh, follow what uh, uh, piques our curiosity, if we um, uh, follow our, our passions, uh, I think this leads us toward something that is our own personal map. And so in our community, uh, that translates into people uh, contributing to the South Ruby Commons, 
or the Enso House, or the new credit union that's forming, or the local um, uh, food bank um, garden that's, that's underway. Let me ask you a question then. So on one hand, I could see that analogy becoming a very separate lack of gathering, in other words, people <coughs> following their passions and heading in many multivariate directions following their own interests, passions. So tell me how everybody going in their own individual directions leads to greater container of wholeness, connectedness, community with a shared goal of taking care of things. And so, because they seem in some ways opposite, and, and I know they're not, but right, I'd like you to right, still speak to right. that. One of the things that I uh, am discovering, I know, but how do I give words to it? Um, is that uh, I believe that we can each uh, act um, with our own um, wholeness, um, our own gifts, and somehow or another we are contributing. We may not know, in fact, most likely we don't know how it fits into the larger whole. That's the magic of it. We gotta get, we gotta fly. You get up and then you look around and you realize Synchronicity. We're all flying together. And uh, there is a, perhaps a trust. Uh, a trust in uh, the body, uh, in the body knowing, in the body logos, in the spirit of us together. Trust in our nature, in the great story that we are taking a part of and a part in. Do I know for sure? Do we, any of us know for sure? We're living. We continue to live. And I get wrapped up, maybe as many of you do, in the news and in the bad news and in the <coughs> craziness of the, of the, of the mindset that, that sees things in terms of winners and losers and good and bad and, and black and white. And actually, uh, we are all we are both, we are and, we are, we're all of that. It's a nuanced spectrum. <clears throat> the distinction between, in design, I imagine to the small extent that I have some inkling into that world, um, both of community and of home and community, speak to the difference between a sense of wholeness and a container or their relationship, if I know I didn't prepare you with that. But still, and one is kind of creating a bowl with which things can trust and happen within. And yet the wholeness is almost like the experience inside, and I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that. So in um, what I'd like, what I'm going to ask you is hold that. So you, so you, the difference between a wholeness and a container? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to bring that up in just a little bit because I'm going to be talking about, uh, for me, what has been a real inspiration has been Christopher Alexander, and I'm going to bring it up within that context. Um, there are, who knows of, does everybody know of Christopher Alexander? Yeah. Yeah. So years ago, um, Chris and others put together um, a pattern language. Um, and uh, this is put out in the mid-70s, and it, it looks at the patterns of places that uh, have life, uh, everything from towns and regions to neighborhoods to building clusters to the details within the building. If you haven't looked at it, it's at the library, check it out. Uh, I came across um, Chris's work in the 75 or 76, and I was feeling agitated and fidgety, and, and I ended up in Berkeley and uh, was at the library and came across uh, their working manuscripts as they were writing this. And um, I was just like, it, I, something was happening when I, when I was reading this because it was touching something really, really deeply in me. I was a young architecture student. I was two, three years in, and for me, design is play. I just, I just love it. I, it's what I just do. It's like breathing. And yet, I come about it uh, naturally, fairly intuitively, or non-verbally, and I just 
like to create things that feel good. Um, what Chris and others were doing is giving a structure to it. There is such a clear structure that, that holds uh, all kinds of space to come at this with feeling. In fact, feeling is, the, is the, uh, one of the key ways of entering this whole world. So I uh, worked, have worked with that for all these years and have deepened through that. And of course I've got, as all of us have, our own approach and our own um, ways in which we digest it and bring it, uh, bring it around again. But anyway, that's been a, a really important one for me. Um, so I'll, I'll answer your question again in just a minute. It's going to be talking about uh, some of the three uh, key ideas that I'm going to bring forward in this. But right now I want to just uh, bring in a piece that maybe it's related to the story of, um, of the geese somehow. Um, a number of years ago, I was um, involved, just as I usually do, in designing and creating, and I, I was trying to, at that point, say, well, get a little more conscious of what you're doing. Um, what's happening? How are you doing this? And I found myself sitting on my shoulder as I'm just kind of playing away and doodling, and, and uh, it's almost like, hey, you just made a choice here. You have a gable that's maybe 9-12 pitch. Why isn't it 12-12 or 4-12? Um, hey, you just drew that window of this kind of a proportion in this location on the, on the wall. Why? Why did, how did you know that? Um, the windowsill that you just did was at you know, 28 inches, not 24, 36 inches or 32, but 28. Why? And so I'm having this just this little dialogue, playful dialogue, and I'm I'm uh, reflecting that it actually has something to do with how it feels. I don't know why, except that it feels right. If there's a sweet spot, it's going. Oh yeah, not this or this, but in this context, just this way. And so I began to explore that, and and all the while where I'm where I'm designing, I'm just trying to integrate what I'm doing um, almost unconsciously. And I begin to get some ideas on that. But I, at one point I test it. And I say, I wonder if this is just me or with, if others. And so um, some of you may know Will and Shelley Black in our community. And I was working with them at that time on designing uh, their house. Well, we didn't know even where the house was. They had some idea. It's sort of like it's over there. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, we got in, in Will's truck, and it was uh, fall, and so you can kind of see, and you can drive around. So I said, tell you what, Will and Shelley, Shelley, let's get in your, in your truck, and let's drive, and I want you to drive down, and just through the woods, wherever you are, just park it where the truck just wants to rest, and kind of where near where the house is to a degree. And so we're driving along, and then boom, we get placed in, the, in, the, um, in this one spot. And I said, are you, are you there? Are we, are we here? Yeah, sure. We get, out of, we get out of the truck. And I say, well, I suggest that we corral the car. And so I got some sticks, and I put a corral around it a little bit. And I said, okay, now where's the house from here? It's over there. And uh, so I said, between the house, uh, the, the car place and the, and the house, let's put a, a little gate. So this is the car place. And then I described uh, this idea that Alexander brings up of entry transition. He says, you don't just enter the house. There's a place of entering between the arrival by vehicle and the door. And I, I said, here's what I'd like us to do. Will? Take a hike. And uh, I worked with Shelley for about five minutes. Now, I want you to, to know that Will and Shelley, um, maybe I shouldn't have brought up their names. <laughs> uh, it's too late now. Well, Will is this wonderful person. He's, he's, uh, he's a real practical, get down dirty guy. He's probably more comfortable with a pitchfork and a um, 
driving around in his muck boots and, and doing stuff. And Shelley is uh, more, has a more artistic sensibility and uh, home, creating home. She's wonderful, wonderful that way. But they're very different. Wonderful together, very different. So I said to Shelley, I said, I am going to be the front door. And I picked up uh, two sticks. Okay, so you imagine two sticks. Uh, and I said, can I walk around with these? Okay, so I, I picked up two sticks. And I said, okay, I am I'm the front door. And we're going to do a little warmer, cooler game. And I said, I'm going to walk around until you tell me whether I'm getting warmer or cooler in terms of where this front door should be. Oh, there, there's the front door. And uh, I said, cooler, cooler, you know, warmer. And I just backed up and moved forward, and I came over this way. And then I, they said, you know, warmer, cooler, warmer, warmer, cooler, <laughs> warmer, warmer. Oh, just, no, just right there. Until we had the spot for the, for the front door. And she just said, that's the spot. Okay, I said, now, imagine that above us is this facade. Maybe it's a gable. And I said, okay, what angle? Warmer or cooler? Until we arrived at the spot when it was just right. And so I put down a couple little, almost not to be seen marks in the ground. And I went through this process with, with Will when he got back. Well... You can see where the story's going. Will spotted the front door within a foot and a half, 40 feet away at the same angle. Uh -huh. And I looked at them and I said, you guys, how did you do that? And they said, it just oh. felt like the spot. <laughs> and uh, I smiled. And uh, I began to have an idea that, that what this capacity is, is what I began to call the beauty mind. The beauty mind is the ability to perceive that sweet spot. That place where, where it's not this way or that way, it's just here. It's the ability to perceive um, beauty. It's an unmeasurable kind of thing, and yet we know, we can feel it. It's a place where when something is just in the right spot, there's a resonance. And, and I, I'm sure that you know what that means. Mm -hmm. So, um, Mark Wall was telling me about Howard Gardner's um, multiple intelligences theory. And Mark is a mathematician, and he's very high on the mathematical intelligence. And other people are linguistic, and so they've got a, a really good um, handle on, on, on language, and others are um, uh, artistic. And so I actually, I don't know whether uh, the beauty mind is an intelligence like that, or whether it's a meta-intelligence. You know, I'm not a scientist this way, I'm just doing my own in from inside out science. And I actually think that um, it crosses uh, disciplines, we crosses languages, uh, different types of intelligences. For example, um, Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, he could visualize a building whole, complete, down to the detail, and he'd just start almost drawing it from one end and end up at the other, and it would be this magnificent building. Um, uh, Bobby McFerrin, you know, what a musician he is. He can switch modalities and rhythms and bring us into this zone. Uh, he's got an amazing musical intelligence, and, and Will Shorts with his puzzles, and what kind of intelligence that is, I don't know. But um, think about, about um, an artist um, working on a painting and looking at the composition and the color and getting everything until it's just right. The ability that they have that just rightness is their painting is that beauty mind. Or a dancer um, doing a particular dance uh, that feels just right. Not that, but this. Or a writer searching for the right words to really get the rhythm down and boom, there it is. So the beauty mind is something that I think we can, that we can work with. Um, if, if I may. Um, part of what I'm hearing is almost classically spoken of as the, 
sculpture that was already there was just the removing of the rock around it. It's almost as if Frank Lloyd Wright's drawing was already there and he allowed it to just flow through. So there's what I'm hearing is somewhat of a surrendering and a some, to some degree it's not that it's non-effortful but it's a different sort of effort of allowing something to be unleashed. And when one is perhaps in a state of beauty mind that perhaps that flows through more easily. I don't think that it's a um, this sculpture is complete within the stone and all you're doing is sort of being mechanical, taking away. I think that it has to do with a very co-creative, collaborative engagement. And um, as we search for wholeness, um, I think that there's a, there's a process to this. Um, hmm. I'll pick up that piece in, in a moment as well. Um, is this making sense? <laughs> yeah? Okay. So, um, the, the, the beauty mind. Um, I think that somehow or another this is part of our, of our own notion um, that can help us lead to wholeness in our world. And it has a lot to do with asking uh, the right questions. I think the question maybe is, um, is the sculptor's chisel. Um, having a good question is, will allow you to get into um, a, um, where you need to go. Without the question, it's, you just, it's kind of, it's mush. There's nothing there. Holding the question and then listening for the answer. See, the, the beauty mind is not here. Or it's not only here. Um, my own sense of it is, is that my entire body has, has an innate intelligence. I don't know how to describe it. I can feel it. Maybe there's science on this. I mean... You're speaking to a chiropractor whose whole foundation of science is built on <laughs> that the body has an innate intelligence, and whether it's the idea felt, you know, Galen's felt sense, or you know, we can okay, go in a right, lot right, of directions. Right, right. Yeah. But there's that that resonating with something that's right for the individual that feels at home, that feels yeah. whole, full, connected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let me let me touch in uh, back to your question about the container and. Um, and wholeness, because I think it, it can begin to fit in here. Um, there are three things I want to bring forward um, of all that Alexander's been working on, and other people have been working on it as well, but uh, the idea of, of levels of scale, of uh, centers, and of boundaries. And there are many more things, but I wanted to talk about these three, and then I'll weave, I'll weave them in. So levels of scale uh, has to do with um, uh, here we are together in a room. Within the room um, is a rug. Uh, beyond the room is the wider neighborhood. Uh, these are beginning to be levels of, of scale. Um, centers. Centers, it's a little bit hard. The word is a little bit hard because a center can, not, can be a, a, a place, an object, can also be a room and a space. So if you can kind of think about centers as wholenesses, uh, this room is a wholeness, a container that's holding us, okay? Um, but it can also be, um, this candle is a kind of a center within the larger room. So at a smaller scale, this candle is a, is a center. Um, then they begin to work together because um, this room as a whole this backdrop begins to hold us. Uh, it reinforces, perhaps, this field, which is another way of describing center. So, um, uh, field, uh, room, space, center, object. And they begin to work together. Now, to reinforce the sense of centeredness, centeringness, both of that, uh, think about boundaries and edges. Um, 
Think about uh, how many of you as a child uh, made little forts out of uh, maybe chairs and blankets, okay? Uh, a cardboard box, uh, you know, that you brought home. Well, you know what that does is two things. One, it establishes boundary. And so you, you create this space. Two, it's about levels of scale. You know, if you're three feet high, and the room is eight or nine feet high, that's three times higher than you. Whereas, you know, for us standing, we're two-thirds the height of the space. And so the space of a room is very different. And so the idea of being enclosed feels comfort comforting, comfortable, and it's exciting, and it's creating, and creative, creativeful. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have the idea of creating uh, boundaries which reinforces being held, which is about centeringness, um, within a larger space, which is we're trying to establish our human scale. Okay. So that's kind of how containers and whole, wholenesses, holdingnesses can fit together. So, so. Let's, I'm going to get local for a moment. So we've had discussions here before, and I think it can be universal, but we're, I'll speak to the community of Whitby. So I'll speak with it. What is it that makes a smaller population, not necessarily a whole community, but what is it that within, for example, one like ours, that creates that palpable sense of interconnectedness, of... You know, so I'm wondering from your design space, some would say, well, we're on an island together, so there's more of a connection and boundary by water. On the other hand, there's woods that we can go off and separate into a lot. So being on Whidbey and being in this community, what is it about the topography? What is it about the way people interact that creates a community more enriched by a sense of wholeness? So I think each of us have our own sense of uh, how much enclosure and openness how much um, uh, privacy and how much community we have. Um, and we, we each have our own right um, balance and right sensibility on that. And so um, being on an island actually as a whole community is very helpful to help define the community. We know when we've arrived. <laughs> the gate goes up and you, know, you, 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 know, you go off the, the ferry boat. And, um, and we know where our edges are. And so I think that reinforces our uh, communal sense of community. Um, but some people like to live um, at, toward the center of things, right down in the village, and be in the mix and be there on Saturday night at the, at the art opening or at the movie theater and uh, conversations. And other people like to be more on retreat and in, a, in their own thing, or they may have a garden that's, that's their own. Yet we are, we're human, which means that we're social animals. We are gregarious. We love to be around one another, uh, to more or less. That's within a frame. Now here's the challenge. I think this is the challenge in our society, is that somehow over the, the last number of years, whether it's the last hundred years or the last sixty years or whatever, we've gotten the idea of the American dream of having uh, our little uh, castles with our yard and our kingdom. And, uh, and of course, that after World War II made a whole lot of sense. Uh, and uh, that made a whole lot of sense for the um, uh, consumer economy because the more we build, uh, the more, the bigger the space we have, the more we can fit in, which increases the, uh, the economy and so forth. So what we've been sold is almost what we've been marketed. It's curb appeal. It's not necessarily our innate human, what makes sense for me if I'm acting as a human, but what makes sense for me as a consumer with what's in front of me. And I think that we've gotten to a point where um, privacy has, has been extended to such a great degree that we're left isolated in our own little kingdoms, surrounded by a sea of houses, and yet isolated. Think about a lot of the, the developments where you drive down the street and who's here? Well, 
two cars live here and three cars live here. <laughs> it's a beautiful room that I've never seen anybody in there, but it sure looks nice. It's, you know, a formal living room and, and this two-story portico. There must be very important people that live there. And yet the life of the house is to the backyard um, and the backyard barbecue. And, of course, privacy, so there are six-foot fences around. And you can't see anybody because oh, I've been coming. I've had such a busy day, such a busy week. Let's let's have this as a place of refuge, a place of um, of quiet. And so that means putting up boundaries. Mm -hmm. And yet here we have arrived where to a place where uh, our families are often spread apart across the country, uh, brothers and sisters and. Parents and kids are all over. And many families, unfortunately, are separated and people are living alone, um, uh, which is fine or not fine, whatever. That's neither here nor there. But the idea, though, is that our society, the structure of our society, our culture, separates us, which is not part of our innate humanness. And so how do we then find our way back into being whole individuals, families, within a community of others where we've got the right balance between um, holding and openness. Um, I think we've got a lot to work on in our society, but I also think that we, that we know a lot. There is. There is. I think we really are at that transition. We could speak of it in a lot of ways, but I'd like to hear when you started to come out with the more pocket neighborhood, looking at a neighborhood in a different way, when you did that, and what has the, for lack of a better word, resistance been like over the last several years? I imagine at the beginning it was stronger, but people are starting to hear, connect that. So could you just speak to kind of what the listening has been to this idea, <coughs> this idea of changing? Well, the idea of, I mean, any any time you... Uh, uh, have something different than your standard lot with a garage and a house. It's like, oh my gosh. Or um, a house with one bedroom and no garage. Oh my gosh. And yet 60% and yet, uh, or more, more than 60% of households, that means all of us in this country, are one or two person households. 63, 4%. That's the super majority. We could do something with that government. Uh, and, yet, and yet most houses are designed for Ozzy and Harriet and the kids and, and all their toys. And so it's the whole idea of bigger is better. And uh, there's never enough. And, um, and so forth. And yet I think we need in our society different colors and flavors and textures and sizes. And uh, I mean, we're all, look at all of us, we're all different. Different ages, different sizes, different sensibilities. And so our houses, uh, we need to demand more. Um, and about 15 years ago, uh, out of some frustration of not seeing alternatives, imagining alternatives, uh, I teamed up with Jim Souls and we, as many of you know, designed and built um, the Third Street Cottages. And um, it's the first of its kind in the country and it's part of a, uh, an ordinance which was the first of its kind in the country. Um, Great for Langley. Yeah. And so once we did this, it not only sold out quickly, but within three months it began to get picked up in the national media. Uh, I think it was New York Times and Sun Sun Sunset Magazine, Metropolis, uh, all the Knight Ritter syndicated newspapers. And, and people were saying, well, why don't we have more of this? And I'm saying, why don't we have more of this? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like this is the answer. But it's one alternative, and I think as, as we get to the different stages of life, um, we, we need more alternatives. Um, backyard cottages, uh, flex houses, multiple um, uh, different people living in, in a house, shared houses, uh, and so forth. We need to open up our, our thinking and our creativity around that. Um, so that allows us to be at home. If our homes are, if our homes are dominating, that means that we're not first. 
our lives and our relationships are first. The buildings around us need to serve us. The spaces around us need to serve us. And I think that um, while I'm, I'm both, this is a paradox, because it matters completely, this physical environment that we live in. And it doesn't matter at all. I mean, it matters that, that we have places that are places where we feel at home in that we can um, be supported to stand in our fullness, to do our work in the world, to do our work in our personal lives um, by the support of the homes that we live in. Uh, and at the same time, don't have them be so precious. If they become precious, then they own you rather than you being held by, by the homes. Okay. Two points that came up with that. One is, I know you know the home we moved into. We had the blessing of having the opportunity. But the point I wanted to make with that is, it's every time that there's a gathering there, it enriches the space mm -hmm. for me personally. Right. And stories happen there, and conversations happen there, and every room gets like a, another layer of tapestry and color, and and with that. So on one hand, in the home space for me at least, it's not the insularness, but the relationships that, that, contain, that happen within that container. So in that way it matters because what's important happens within it. Right. It's not that the walls are important. And I also see that in the community, a good example, it's just been delightful to watch that sweet spot, for example, of Moe's Pub open. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Because it doesn't matter so much that it's a pub or what they serve, it was something that was just needed for people to gather at odd yeah. times and different, and yeah. it's just, uh, I smile at it with just thinking about it. And uh, Saturday night after Museo, if you were there, it was just this rich people weaving in and out and, and spaces and like the commons. It's like that so much too. Those gathering places for stories and relationships to happen within. Right. And it's also right. nice when the right. spaces are nice to look at. So, so um, um, Moe's Pub and uh, Southwoodby Commons and the others, these happened because people said, I feel like this needs to happen here. That's a tapping inside. Yeah, we have something like that happening on Clinton with Anchor Books right now. Mm -hmm. That same sort of uh, feeling. It was wonderful during the storm to go by there and see people who had walked in just to be in with other people. It's a, it's a real, it's that, that real cozy sort of right, feeling. Right, right, right. And like it's just like it was just it was just needed, and when it appeared, everyone said, "Oh, that's it." it so really I, want to, I want to bring this in. So the sense of it's needed. Let's bring that in. Um, let's see if I can. I, I want to talk and bring in a piece about the process of design. How are we doing for, for time? Okay. okay, I want to have enough time to really hear your questions. But there's a piece that I want to bring in tonight. And that is um, uh, the process of design, the process of creating places. Um, and I think it relates to what I've been talking about, this, this sensibility of knowing. And um, uh, so let's say that, I'm going to bring an example. I was working with uh, some friends of ours, many of you would know. And uh, I was invited over. And I'm trying to help them make sense of their home. Um, their, their kids have grown, in fact they've got a, a grandchild, a uh, new grandchild, and they're beginning to see their house as, <coughs> as a, the next generation's, this is, will become sort of the home for the whole family. And so their sensibility for their house shifted. Mm -hmm. And they invited me in to try to get a, a feel for it, and, and the focus was in on the kitchen, because the kitchen's not working, and we worked on that. And I said, there's something else that's off here, and I don't know what it is but I could feel it. And as I began to kind of get a sense, I said, it's over here. And um, I realized that here is the living space, and there are these French doors that open out onto a, a, a deck, a terrace. And yet, um, coming and going, you go right through the middle of the living room. And the seating area is not quite s right for the distances and you can't have other people because you've got to allow for this coming and going through the French doors. 
So the French doors are a great idea that allow you to open out, and yet what it's dud, 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 <laughs> what it has done is to somehow or another violate the integrity, the wholeness of the room. Think about, about the symbol. It says, don't do that, don't go there. Um, so there's the room, and there's the path through the room. If there's one thing you take out from this, hopefully there'll be others, create rooms and don't divide them. Reinforce them with the kind of things that happen within the room. And, and so I could be said of Clinton. And that could, Clinton, 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 Washington is, was a small town, the landing, and the state highway came in, uh, and they brought in a four-lane highway right through the center of town, and it's never recovered. Would you, those of you in Clinton? It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Four-lane. One of those. So, um, I, as I began to think about this, and, and I said, um, let's shift some things. Um, let's imagine that the door is over here. We're going to close that up, and, and I imagined, and we mocked up a little window seat with a deep sill, about that high, and a, something with cushions. And I said, let's move the sofa, oh, interesting, let's move the sofa. Uh, there was a particular angle and it actually helped with the not quite, here was the sofa and the fireplace was over here, they were like this. Mm -hmm. And I said, move the, the sofa, and all of a sudden it began to speak with or reinforce the center of the fire, where the fireplace was. And then uh, I was looking around and they had this wall with lots of different things. And I said, look at the sofa, it's got this really, it's like this, this really rich you know, color. And uh, there were lots of different things over here. And I said, let's take all of those off. Can you bear with me? <laughs> and I said, you know, what I imagine here is some really strong artwork. At which point, um, uh, they said, well, I've got something. We went up the stairway and pulled down this uh, gorgeous Native American um, print with this color, this deep red color and black and white and we put that up on the wall and all of a sudden we kind of looked at each other and went, whoa, the presence of the room came into being. And all we did was to mock up a few things. It took 10 minutes. And so we, we began to find the integrity, the wholeness, um, the presence of the room. Okay. Now, we can go on further and begin to do the small arrangements and the, maybe it needs a wall that's painted a color. Maybe it, it needs other things. But the way in which these are done, and this is part of the process that I want to talk about, is that whatever you're working on, shift to the next level of scale, what's around it, because that is holding what's smaller. And what's smaller then, as you act on your own behalf, I'm putting this table here, but it's not here, it's here because it helps reinforce the presence of this centered space. And so this table is a center, an object, which then might have um, things to reinforce the center here if that's what we want. So this table becomes, at the small scale, a context for what's within it. But right now the table is reinforcing the context of this whole room. And so as you begin to look at a place, feel a, feel a place. Looking is pushing. There's another way of seeing which is receiving. Wow. I don't know if you, if you can sense that difference. Mm -hmm. there's, there's almost like listening eyes. Mm -hmm. And sometimes mm -hmm. when I'm um, trying to see something, I, I relax and I try to feel um, the field. Mm -hmm. Um, and I try to, to get a sense of it. So, as you're in a space, if something feels off, relax. Try to take it in and say, what's the largest wholeness here? Now, how do I make it stronger? And it might be by bringing a rug in, or shifting the furniture, or bringing a painting in, or uh, a table. So you're working with creating 
wholeness. See, I'm getting more tangible. Mm -hmm. Creating wholeness. We talked about, about intangible sort of great ideas and then making it tangible. That's a little joke here. Um, so these are ways in which we, we make wholenesses. So here's a room that we're working on. Now, let's go outside and you have your front door to the street. Well, first of all, when you go out there, you realize that the street is a place for traffic and it's taken care of by the city and uh, they've got their right-of-ways and their um, distances that they have and I, oh, I take care of what's you know, in my property line. Well, you're standing out on the street and you realize this isn't a whole place. It wholeness. It's not holding. It's a place for cars to zoom, oh, cars to zoom through uh. Um, and yet, um, in residential neighborhoods, streets are rooms. Streets are rooms. And so, if I, on my uh, sense of my own house, want to create something, um, the question that I need to ask is, well, let me go out to the larger scale and say, what would make this street a better room? It may be that my house is positioned in such a way that, that it really asks for the house to be a little forward and maybe a little more landmark sensibility. Or maybe the house is in the middle of the block and it just wants to be part of a rhythm uh, through here uh, of several houses together. And so you realize um, how things are. Oh. I'm going to do this and I'm going to then improve the street that I'm on. Um, okay, now think about what improves um, a, a center. Remember I talked about boundaries? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times what's missing are the layers, the, la the, the, the edges between the street and the house. Mm -hmm. And so you've got street, sidewalk, door. Or maybe there's a little porch to kind of fidget with your keys as you get in. But a boundary uh, is a place. A boundary has dimension to it. Okay? So an edge, here's an, here's an edge. Now this edge has one, two, three, the carpet, four sort of layers to it. Yeah, that's part of, of this. We're sitting on a porch of sorts. And the layeringness um, makes it not only comfortable, but allows us to come into relationship because of the, the, the boundaries that are, that are layered, that are given dimension. So let's say that you've got a, um, a, a motel. You can picture it immediately. The door, the car, no edge. What's happening uh, with the curtains inside? Shut. They're shut. I need more bound, I need more edge. What's happening with the people inside? They stay inside. The people outside, they, they actually walk right by the window. So take that n no boundary sense and widen it a little bit. It doesn't have to be a lot. And let's put a porch big enough that we can have two or three people and maybe a railing that's high enough and perhaps a railing that sets a little bit of a boundary and maybe when a, a neighbor comes over they can perch on the, on the railing and you can begin to have conversations. So at that point, I, as a shy person, would feel more comfortable coming outside and sitting on the porch because it's established a dimensionful, dimensional edge to the street. Uh, what does Garrison Keillor say? He said, uh, uh, it helps uh, shy persons get up and do what needs to be done. <laughs> uh, so that's, you know, it, it helps us come out and engage in a way that's protected and yet open. Our own selves, think about a place of health. For most of us, it's probably not isolated for most of our lives in a cave or in a suburban house behind the shut curtains. It's probably also not out, you know, on the, uh, the speaker's pedestal in the middle of the park. <laughs> there's going to be this balance where the right, there's a rightness between enclosure um, and exposure. 
the porch that we've created together has a nice balance to it um, because it's so high, you know, as you're walking along the way. Or it might be I'm reading a book and uh, and it's a Saturday afternoon and I'm and I'm in this and you see a neighbor walking by. This is a body language saying, you know, I'm concentrating here. This is not the time for a, a, a wonderful chat. That'll be another time. But, you know, a little nod and a hello. So these are signals, body language signals that the environment can help you support. And I really just noticed when you said that for the first time, it really goes both ways because I have certain homes in my neighborhood that there's part of me that wants to be put up a little barrier there right. because it feels like a fishbowl and it feels like don't you want a little privacy maybe not maybe but it feels yeah. a little awkward like I don't yeah. want to see that much and and there's like this sweet spot for me both ways and they get to do whatever they wish that's to right. do of course <laughs> that's right and if I wish but uh, but it really is it, it's a it's a comfort zone for each of us of what's a sweet spot yeah <coughs> um, so one thing is that you don't have to necessarily have the ability to design your own home, which is you get what you start with, but you certainly can alter, change, It also doesn't amend. take vast amounts of money. It takes just arriving and being present. And um, it's just, well, I think what it takes is a shift in perception. Um, instead of seeing objects and seeing homes as commodities, uh, we're trying to see fields we're trying to see the various different scales of, of rooms and, and, and elements that, you know, the world, in my view, it's possible that it's an amazing, amazing tapestry, uh, you know, an ecology of uh, whole wholenesses, of whole spaces, at every level of scale. I think about design, I think about uh, the built environment as, as an ecology. And uh, with an ecology, I mean, that little tiny niche with this life within the niche is in and among itself, but it's got a service to the larger niche which it's a part of, which is part of a larger niche. And they're all working together in concert, in a dynamic concert, not static, stale, but creative. And each of us, in our own individual ways, in our own ways that we create our spaces, um, be it the small things or the large things in, in the community. We have a sovereignty as a whole community when we come together in a sense of community. Now I think that we can create these places at each of the levels um, of scale. And the environment will support the inner environment. The environment will support the relationships. Mm -hmm. The distance that we are, we're not... 15 feet apart. I see your face, I see your eyes. If we are in a, in a living room, way at the back is too far. But here we are in a room with this many people and it feels good. Uh, some time ago I was in a classroom with 15 people and the, the, the students were sitting all over the place. And I just said, hey guys, we are not holding together. So when you think about um, who we are as a community, who we are as, here we are, a community for an hour or so. And so we are holding the space together, each of us, all of us. Before we wind down and close, before we open it to questions, is there any last idea that you want to make sure you deliver? Because questions may take us anywhere. So no. I want to give you one last opportunity if there's something else you'd like to share. Oh, so. we could go for hours, <laughs> hours. But do you get the sense of, of what, I'm, what I'm trying to talk about, um, about the fact that um, I think we each, within ourselves, have a sensibility. And if our sensibility, if we open to the context that we're in, we can begin to um, uh, feel what our unique gift would be. And what's magical is that when we live... Um, from our passion and act with our convictions, um, somehow or another, what we do fits. And we create a larger world that has coherence. Thank you.
know, I think it's, it's very interesting what you said because in listening to you talk, there's a sense that there's a right way that things should be. And yet, from my experience in the home that I live in, which I think there's a distinction between a house and a home, in the home that I live in, my partner has this amazing ability to keep moving the center around. To <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, so come into the room and say, what happened? And, uh, I don't know if this is a, uh, a gender curse or if it's just a gender opportunity. But I get used to where things are. I get comfortable with it. Now, if you can have my wife say, I don't think there's any other way we can do this room. And by God, if I don't come home tomorrow, then it's a different way. Yeah. And it works. It has that sense of balance yeah. and wholeness about it that says, ah, I can, I can be here and be part of that center. Sometimes we need things not to change, and sometimes it's really healthy to shake things up. Mm -hmm. You know, get out of our neural pathways, our habits, our just modes of uh, you know do it and just do it differently. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Alexander has this and his students together developed this notion that there isn't just one answer that's centered. He, they refer to this as a field of centers. Right. There's, a, there's this little cluster, and, and those are right. And you know it intuitively that this is right, but also just this. And, and so perhaps your wife is exploring the whole, <laughs> the whole range of, field, of this field. But I also have a sense that Ruby knows how to play with scale and get things in the right places. She and, does. And, yeah. it, and, and it's, she's, she's like a juggler. Mm. Really? <laughs> think about, think about um, so when you have a, a room within a house and a garden as part of a street that's a room, and then you begin to, in your own unfolding of the space, find those, how, what did you call them? A field, of a field of centers, and so we created, you know, a number of things here. But there, there, there are more actual connections that are made between the the elements, and there are resonant connections. And the more connections there are in a space and across levels of scale, the stronger it will be. Um, the more presence it will have, the more sense of place it will have. And so, as you're as you're working on things look at, well, where are the edges, and how do we give it more dimension? How do we give it more layers and more complexity of sorts? And it's a kind of a complexity that will add to a depth rather than a um, complexity, and there's complicated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not complicated. It's the opposite of complicated. So Kurt asked um, about uh, the uh, ramifications of the book. Well, just what is kicking up? What's kicking up? And uh, whether this might, the pocket neighborhood idea might have, uh, you know, could it have happened 20 years ago? As I mentioned before, I think the idea of pocket neighborhoods is getting at uh, what is our uh, innate human, innate human nature, <laughs> the nature of being human. Um, so I think it could happen anytime. I think that, that uh, there's kind of a resonance to the idea of, of living in relation with nearby neighbors. You know, the question, do you know your neighbors, is generally kind of a hoping for a positive answer kind of thing. No, I don't know any of my neighbors. I haven't seen him for months. <laughs> yeah, he, mows, he mows his lawn on Sundays. That's when I see him. Um, that's not the answer that you generally you know, want to hear with you know your neighbors. So um, that's why I'm saying I think that, that if we can move in the direction of helping us be in relation with our nearby neighbors. So uh, here's what's going on. This has been absolutely wonderful to get out in the world. Um, I think the new urbanists have embraced it. Uh, Co-housing people have embraced it. Um, a lot of people who follow Sarah Susanka and the whole idea of the not-so-big house have embraced it. Um, uh, developers across the country are calling, um, planners, um, so forth. Here's, here's a point that I want to bring out. So the work that a lot of, uh, the work that you may think that I have been doing um, 
which are these absolutely wonderful cottages around a garden um, in our community and elsewhere. Um, I, when we did it, I thought that was wonderful and I didn't know that there was anything else like it. And when I researched further, I found that actually there's a lot of historic precedent. And uh, not only uh, the idea of um, cottage courtyards and bungalow courts in history, but the whole idea of living nearby neighbors living around some kind of a shared commons. Uh, and that might be an alleyway that's reclaimed, or it might be um, neighbors that have pulled their backyards uh, fences back and created a play area or a barbecue or what have you. The confusion that's gotten out, um, I think, is that the um, examples that, that I have done with over the last 15 years have been detached houses with porches around a garden and the cars are pulled away to the side. That's one form of a pocket neighborhood. What I'm trying to bring forward is that pocket neighborhoods are about nearby neighbors coming into relation together around some kind of a shared commons or room. The room might be a street, if the street is like a little lane, a small lane. It's got to be pedestrian, human-scaled, human-oriented. It might be um, a, uh, in an urban setting. Um, uh, there's a factory down in uh, the Bay Area that I know of, and the, about 20 families have moved in and reclaimed it. Well, they have sort of a, uh, an area and it's widened. They actually park there some of the time, and that becomes the commons and the kids play there. It's human scaled, it's a commons, it's surrounded by these little uh, apartments within the, within the, the factory uh, area. So they're not just um, cute little bungalows in garden settings. Um, they can happen actually where we live. Um, th you know, think about the street. If you live near others, I mean you could live out on acreage and that's another story, but if you live near others, Look at, well, how do we uh, begin to make a gesture, a connection with uh, those of us around us, a connection and a contribution. I'm acting on behalf of myself in relationship with what's around me and therefore contributing to the larger whole. And it might be, um, maybe you're along a, um, on edge cliff and you know the, the walks are pretty long. Well, it may be that you create a little bench, you know, right outside your hedge for people to come and walk. I know in um, um, Southern California there's a place that I visited and um, it's a place where there are a lot of dog walkers and so this woman had um, created a foot activated dog watering bowl. Uh, you know dogs get hot and they <laughs> love to drink when they get hot. So that's a gesture. Uh, in Portland, um, the um, uh, city repair folks, look this up, cityrepair.org, um, have done some absolutely wonderful things. They, there's one woman, or one, I think it's a, uh, a resident, created a little tea stand with a shelter and every day she brings out hot water in the thermos and you, you can take a mug and there's tea cups and it's a place to gather and hang out. It's a way to connect. I was wondering then that in addition to in these small neighborhoods where where people in their residences can share, it can be done in a business setting too? Yes. This, this last weekend I went to um, a, a conference in um, Clinton on the future, using a future search process to look at the, the future of Clinton. And one of the things that came out of it, of course, is the need for a community center or a center of the community. And I just, it, just, it just struck me that, that, that that's what they were talking about when they were talking, when people were talking about the difference between a community center and a center of the community, that, that has that feeling. That so they, they hopefully would be in the same location. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. that would be nice, wouldn't it? You know, um, Alexander has this really neat idea um, called latent centers. And uh, a latent center is having a feeling like something belongs here. So that's the next place where something is going to, to appear. Moe's Pub in Langley. Um, think about a, a, a table. Uh, you gathered uh, friends over and it's a, you maybe have settings and the, the center is just completely empty. There is a, a latent center begging for a centerpiece. 
Um, it might be a wall. Imagine this wall without, without the painting or the, the, the photograph. We would feel that something was missing. Yeah. That's a latent center. That says when you activate the center, you go, ah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it feels good. And so as you're walking around, be it in your own home, or be it in the neighborhood, or somewhere in the community, ask, are there any latent centers that I can feel? Mm -hmm. That's a really neat notion. Mm -hmm. One last question? Anybody? Yeah, I guess. Um, Russ, one of my passions is that, you know, we have a, an incredibly aging population and we have lots of single women, 60 and over. And I happen to know in Europe, maybe you've heard, uh, in the Middle Ages there were a group of women called the Beguines who created communities all over Europe. Um, in different formats, some were the sh sort of the neighborhood concept or around a common center, some looked like convents, whatever, though they were not nuns. But when I bring this up often to women about some sort of shared lifestyle and creating relation, relational home places, the first thing that comes out is, oh, I, I just couldn't live that close to someone else. Or there's a their fear that comes up because we're so schooled into our own space, you know, the things you talked about, uh, the housing. So I know that this, I followed your work for years, and I haven't been on Whidbey very long, but I was incredibly excited that you lived here. <laughs> because years ago, I was following your stuff on the web. But I guess what I'm saying is first just to put in the air that there is this wonderful opportunity for women who are solo more and more from age 60 and whatever to, to open themselves to different ways of living. One of the concerns is affordability. You know, affordability of being able to have like six or eight cottages around us. A common space, but I just wonder if you'd speak to that a little bit. Well, like, again, I think that we need more alternatives, mm -hmm. and I think that we um, we don't necessarily have to be so um, precious or wait until a developer comes along and, and creates it. It may be a larger house that that you move into and just try it out. Uh, the one thing I think it's important is that it's. It's about community, but unless you have privacy, community mm -hmm. is, is yeah. it, there's a resistance. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, a chair with nothing around us on the porch, I feel too exposed. Once you begin to hold to the proper degree, then you feel like you can engage with others. Um, and so I think that um, for individuals, especially older individuals who have if I may, individuated. We've become our own wonderful, colorful characters. And it's uh, perhaps, um, it's fine, uh, I'm treading to care carefully here. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to say is that culture, are, you, are you looking at the audience? <laughs> I'll look at all of you. Look at me. Um, I, I think that, that we need to find ways in which we can hold our home places uh, our, the sovereignty of our own individual spaces and here is someone else and someone else. We have our own realms and then we have places that we come together. And the pocket neighborhood idea is that we are going to soften um, the space between us and create a semi-private area that is held by a small number of people. It's not public, but it's not private. It's in between. And I think that it, there are ways to do this. It might be in a larger house, or it might be getting two or three houses together, opening up the backyard. It might be bringing in, there's some wonderful buildings that are happening now, these tiny little buildings. Well, imagine several tiny little buildings and a main kitchen. So you would have a little, you know, your own space, and another person would have their own space, and another their own space. That is your place where you hold your life um, whole. But also, you come and maybe there's a large kitchen and a dining area and a place to share. So having both complete private, 
full privacy allows for community. Thank you, Thank you for making this yeah. space yeah. a center.